Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. And uh, so thanks a lot for, uh, to all the company members for uh, putting me on the program and for you know, putting uh, uh, together a very great program. So this paper is about uh, market structure and market power in, uh, in China. <clears throat> so, you know, there's this ongoing debate about a rising market power, uh, both you know, in the United States, in China, and also at the global level. And most of the existing literature has really focused on uh, you know, understanding market power on broader markets, right? Now, firms in concentrated industries may as well have some market power on their input markets. And so the question of this paper is to think about, well, when we see industries becoming more concentrated, when we see markets becoming more concentrated, does that mainly give firms market power on their product markets, or does it give firms power on their market power on their input markets? So can firms, when industries become more concentrated, can they mainly uh, increase prices of their products above the marginal cost of pro producing those products? Or does it mainly lead to firms you know, pushing down input prices below the marginal revenue product of these input suppliers? And, and how can we tease apart these two uh, different types of market? Now, that's an empirically challenging question. And the reason why that's empirically challenging is that you know, both marginal costs and marginal products are inherently made. So we need a model to recover these marginal costs of these producers uh, se separately from these marginal products of these input suppliers. Now, there are two ways uh, uh, in the IO literature to think about uh, you know, modeling using data, uh, modeling these marginal costs and these marginal products. So first is to say, well, we can impose a full model of how markets work how firms compete, how they choose prices. So, you know, that's kind of the BLP tradition. Uh, another way is to say, well, maybe we can impose less assumptions on how firms compete on their markets, but maybe we can impose a model of how firms produce and infer some uh, information about uh, uh, both you know, marginal products and marginal costs uh, from that kind of production approach. And that's the, the whole group approach, right? Now, the idea of this paper is to say, well, maybe the, we, maybe these models are not mutually exclusive. Maybe we can combine parts of these two types of modeling traditions to have more information about both marginal costs and marginal products. And so the setting in which I do this is the Chinese secret manufacturing industry. Now, why is it interesting? Well, so, so uh, there's been lots of increasing concentration in many state-owned enterprise dominated industries in China, among which the secret manufacturing industry. And the interesting thing about this industry is that, as I will show you later, there was a very big shock to uh, the market structure in this industry, which was led by some states, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of state generated. So there was some, were some policy changes that led to increased concentration uh, in these markets. And, and it's kind of a neat industry to think about, you know, uh, uh, the effects of, of, of these types of uh, policy changes. So, so, you know, this increasing concentration, how this affected both the ability of the cigarette manufacturers to both set their prices, cigarette prices on consumer markets, uh, but also uh, input, mark, uh, input prices under input markets. And so I will combine, you know, both these types of models to then have a model of both, you know, supply and demand to then think about markets and margins uh, in this uh, let me uh, explain a bit more about the industry. So the value chain of this industry looks as follows. So there are uh, a lot of farmers in China, so millions of farmers uh, in China, who have been selling uh, tobacco leaf to cigarette manufacturers. Now, these cigarette manufacturers are uh, the unit of analysis in, in the data. So we, we have data on these uh, cigarette manufacturers. And the number of cigarette manufacturers in China has dropped from 350 to 150 uh, uh, over a time period studies, which is between uh, 98 and 2007. So, you know, there's a big, uh, uh, so, so lots of cigarette manufacturers have been, been forced out of the market uh, over this time period, right? And then these manufacturers sold cigarettes uh, to a wholesaler, which is actually government owned and which is, uh, uh, well, which is actually just one very big state-owned uh, enterprise that buys these cigarettes from its manufacturers. Now, this immediately raises a question. So when we see these manufacturing, uh, these manufacturers 
you know, being being uh, kicked out of the markets, and these markets becoming more concentrated, did this mainly lead to decreased leaf prices, or did it lead to to change in input price? But then, even if we observe these prices, just observing changes in prices will not give us the change in market power because we need to know whether uh, marginal costs of these manufacturers change and whether marginal revenue products of these farmers change, right? And so in order to have to know wh whether you know, markups on cigarette markets change and markdowns on tobacco leaf markets change, we need a model to infer both the marginal costs of these manufacturers and the marginal products of these farmers. So that's the, the empirical uh, challenge in, uh, in this setting. Very briefly on the data. So I have you know, the classical production cost data on these manufacturers from your balance sheets. Uh, and then and then a feature which is which is kind of crucial in uh, in, in you know, this type of models is that I also observe uh, quantity data on the number of cigarettes that are produced by these manufacturers. Okay, let me let me start by you know sharing some uh, uh, reduced form evidence. So what you see here is the relative input expenditure of these cigarette manufacturers on um, <clears throat> tobacco leaf versus labor. So, you know, there, there are two main variable inputs are tobacco leaf and labor. And what you see here in the, in the blue line is cigarette manufacturers that were, so, so this ratio of the manufacturers that were producing in uh, markets that were not consolidated. So I'll explain this a bit later, but so in essence, you have different markets here on which manufacturers operate. And there are some markets in which, which were not affected by the consolidation, so in which there were no firms that were closed, versus the, the firms uh, uh, in the red line, which were the firms in markets which were affected by uh, by fiber. And so the reform consisted of pushing out firms that produced less than certain production thresholds. So what happened is that in 2002, the Chinese government said, well, we will close down all the cigarette manufacturers that are producing less than 100,000 cigarette cases a year. And these markets, so these, these uh, tobacco leaf markets, are isolated by law, so you cannot trade tobacco leaf between these markets. And what happened is that if you look at these markets which were not affected by the consolidation, so in which no firms were closed, the re so, so leaf expenditure over labor dropped a little bit, but it dropped much more in these markets that were consolidated. And so, so what this tells you is that, well, it can mean this, this figure can imply two things. So either it's leaf prices compared to labor prices that went down by more in these markets that consolidated, but it can also mean that there has been some technical change and that these manufacturers were substituting from uh, tobacco leaf towards labor. Now, the interesting thing about this industry is that if you think about it, Tobacco leaf is like kind of a classic input that is non-substitutable. So to produce a cigarette, you need a certain amount of tobacco leaf. And so in order to generate these kind of uh, uh, changes in input prices, it seems very strange that there would be some technical uh, reason for, for the substitution of inputs, right? And so that's kind of a, a feature of many manufacturing industries that you can substitute away labor for capital, but it's much harder to substitute away like raw materials uh, for capital. And that will also be a key uh, uh, feature of the model that it's you know, not so easy to identify both markets and margins when you have some of these inputs that are not substitutable. Uh, Michael, yeah. can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Actually, um, so this is very interesting. Uh, uh, one way to look at it is, uh, is the, instead of looking at, you know, uh, exiting or consolidations to look at uh, uh, group size, uh, say that uh, if you sort uh, cigarette uh, groups by their size, and then you see if, you know, this uh, uh, intermediate input share decreases uh, as uh, size goes up. And at the same right. time, labor share doesn't really change much. Uh, with size. So, so that will be a kind of a very nice uh, evidence to show to disentangle markups and uh, uh, marks, markdowns, right? 
from, uh, right. from intermediate inputs. Right. So yes, but um, <clears throat> you know, one problem is that size is correlated with lots of other things, right? So so in general, like if you would, you know, the the input supply curve should be upward sloping in terms of some buyer power in urban markets, but the marginal revenue product, like the marginal revenue curve, should be downward sloping. And so if you have market power. If these firms have market power only on the input markets, then I fully agree. Then we should see this relationship. Of, so then bigger firms would have to have lower input prices. But the problem is that in general, these firms also may have more market power in the product markets, right? And so input input prices are set as some fraction of product prices. And so it's not all that easy to like separate out these two effects, right? So that's why so I'm saying, practice. you know, just to look at the gap between the two kind of profiles. Look at right. negotiate and you know that helps you to kind of separate these two things. Am I right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. And so, <clears throat> so I agree, right? So, so we can look at these prices and it tells us something, but then the problem is still that, for instance, the uh, productivity of these firms may have changed as well, and so that also uh, applies to your comment. So. So these larger firms may also just be more productive, which is why we would also observe lower prices, right? And so, so here as well, so the main motivation of the government to, uh, to push out these small firms was that these firms are much, much less productive. So if you just plot you know, productivity metrics on, on sizes in this industry, as in many other industries, you just see that these small firms are much less productive and that they, and so they also uh, use typically like uh, older uh, type of uh, vintage capital, uh, et cetera. So, so this pattern could not just relate to, to uh, changes in market power, it could also relate to you know, change in productivity uh, if this, this reform is really uh, successful in increasing productivity, right? And so, so just looking at prices will not give us a full answer. We need a model in which we can separate out both what happens to productivity in this industry and what happens to uh, both product and input prices, right? And so what that, about that's exactly the, the wage yeah. markdown? I'm sorry? I mean, the wage markdown. Uh, yeah, so this is <clears throat> so this is average, but if you weight it by, uh, uh, for instance, by labor expenditure, so in the paper, I have all the different graphs. So if you weight it by uh, labor expenditure, or if you weight it by intermediate input expenditure, it all looks very similar. So, so it's not just a reallocation of larger firms or smaller firms or the other way around. It's really about, uh, you know, within these firms, market power is increasing over time, right? I mean, by this time, by this point, we don't know whether it's market power, but within firms, uh, relative uh, leave expenditure is falling uh, over time. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the intermediate the input price, I remember you, you also look at the wage, right? The wage markdown. And then it doesn't yeah, really yeah, yeah. affect the labor market. Uh, no, no, no. So the yeah. <clears throat> so so this is this is all relative. So we don't know it yet. But when I separately look at wages and intermediate input prices, then what I see is that it's mainly about the intermediate inputs, right? So on, on labor markets, there is very little that changes at all, which is also partly because you know these contracts are typically. Or typically dynamically set, right? It's not that easy for, for these state of enterprises. So to these change are SOEs, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So so on labor markets, I, I don't I don't I don't see I, I don't see anything changing. So it's really on these on these leaf markets. Yeah, which makes sense because it's it's in, on the short run the only markets in which these firms can choose anything is typically on their intermediate input markets. So if they if they have monopoly power somewhere, then it should be on these input markets. Yeah. Okay. Let me briefly walk you through the model. So the model has two components. So you remember these two types of modeling approaches. So there's a production function and there's a model of how these firms compete on their input markets, right? Now, in terms of production, the key thing in this paper is that there is a subset of inputs is not substitutable, right? So in this case, it's tobacco leaf M produced by these manufacturers F in times T. So you have these materials M, which is mainly tobacco leaf, which are non-substitutable. So there is this 
this Leontief of production function between intermediate inputs and then labor capital. So firms can substitute be between labor L and capital K, but they cannot substitute between materials and either labor or capital, right? And then there's some predictivity shocks and there's some measurement error uh, epsilon. Now, firms can differ in terms of how much leave they use uh, uh, in, the, you know, in production, but they cannot, like these differences in leave uh, uh, amounts per, per cigarette do not relate to differences in uh, either labor or capital usage, right? I can extend this, you know, broader than, than setting so, so I can also like, you know, just estimate the substitution elasticity between all these inputs. And, and, and I find evidence for indeed, you know, this industry being a Leon right? Now, <clears throat> so, so that's for the production side. And so there's a production function. We, we know how to estimate a production function. Now, why is it interesting? Well, that will give us the marginal revenue products of, you know, these inputs, right? Then on the input supply sides, there's a model of how these firms compete in their input markets. So their input prices for labor WL, so labor wages, and uh, leaf prices uh, WM. So as I already said, these manufacturing worker wages will be considered to be exogenous. I have some evidence there and I indeed find that they're exogenous, but for now, you know, assume manufacturing workers to have wages that are exogenous and set, but uh, uh, leaf prices are endogenous. So whenever a firm increases how much cigarettes they produce, this also increases holding everything else fixed the leaf price they pay on uh, under the markets. Now, wages are not just determined by size of firms. It, it's also determined by uh, other characteristics of firms that enter the supply function, like the supply, the utility function of these suppliers. And I call these Z for the observed characteristics. So for instance, the state, like the ownership structure of a firm is one of you know, these characteristics that probably is correlated to things that enter the supply uh, function of these input suppliers and uh, unobserved firm characteristics as uh, you know? So think about the location of these firms. If you're a manufacturer that is located close to a highway, then it's probably easier to get to these firms uh, to supply uh, your tobacco, right? Now, this is really crucial because these, these, these unobserved characteristics will lead to you know, the typical simultaneity problems that you have when estimating demands that those apply to the supply side as well. So if we wanna estimate this supply function, then it's crucial that there are these unobserved uh, firm characteristics that will both enter the supplier uh, utility function, but that would also, you know, these manufacturers of course know how attractive they are to their suppliers and they will take this in, into account when setting their own prices, right? Now there are leaf markets high, and a set of competitors, uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, F uh, uh, on these leaf markets, right? And so it's, 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 this set of firms is changing over time due to these changing regulations on how large you have to be to be in the market, right? And then the key parameter to, to estimate on the input supply side, to identify on the input supply side, is this price elasticity of the input supply curve. So, if these, if these manufacturers have some pricing power on their leaf markets, then the elasticity of uh, uh, the input supply elasticity of these, uh, of these farmers should be upward sloping. While if these firms don't have any uh, pricing power in the input markets, then this, you know, the supply function should, should be flat and, uh, and this, this parameter psi m should, should just be one. Right. Okay. Now, the key reason why firms may have any monopsony power in this industry over this, this, uh, uh, over this tobacco leaf is that these, these agricultural labor markets are typically just super frictional. And it applies to China, but it applies to many other uh, countries as well. Now, why is it the case? Well, you have these farmers that operate on really small blocks. So they're, they're, they're usually pretty small. Uh, and they operate both on markets that are isolated. So by law, you cannot transport tobacco leaf between these leaf markets. So, so you know, regulation makes it that these markets are isolated, which of course you know, limits the amount of competition between these manufacturers on these leaf markets. But also by you know, the nature of farming, 
it's, it's, it's typically hard to substitute between different cash crops. So we know that from the agricultural uh, econ literature, but it's also just hard to exit agri agriculture. So, so or it's, it's not hard, but it's, it's really unattractive, uh, uh, at least on the short term, because these are uh, uh, you know, decisions that are much, it's much harder to exit agriculture and to switch to any other industry than to switch between manufacturing jobs, uh, for instance, right? And so, so those are all frictions on these on these labor markets that, of course, enable these these manufacturers to to explode these frictions and uh, and, and when setting their lead price, right? Uh, let, let me ask you a kind of institutional sure. uh, question. This seems yeah. to be important here. So, uh, uh, for instance, you know, uh, I think in, in Beijing and let's say Shanghai, I know you know probably one of the largest cigarette groups in in China is located in Shanghai. And Shanghai mm -hmm. clearly uh, doesn't really have uh, uh, those farmers. So, right. uh, so to some extent, it's not really a uh, isolated uh, markets, right? So some uh, outside, you know, cigarettes groups outside that uh, location may actually come and uh, buy some leaves. So, so what exactly is kind of the institutional arrangement? So it, it, right. may, it will make a lot of sense, you, you know, if one province, uh, in my mind, you know, one province just uh, have, uh, has a one kind of big group, cigarette group, and it really looks like a monopsony. Uh, but in some cases, I feel like uh, it must be a channel for outsiders to come and buy up, you know, local leaves. So how this thing is done? Right. Uh, you have like... <clears throat> so... The, the general arrangement is that every uh, manufacturing group operates a purchasing station. So, so they have some agents purchasing leaf for them and they operate uh, at the county level. And so normally the farmers, if you're in, in county A, uh, are not allowed to sell tobacco leaf outside of their county. Now, in some cases, we actually know that across counties, uh, within prefectures, you know, there are some stations that operate kind of at the border and that treat like that, that can sell to farmers in different counties. But it's by law mandated that it's forbidden to to transport tobacco leaf outside of these locations, except if you have explicit permission by uh, the industry regulator, which is called the SPMA, at the province level. So at the province level, every uh, every province has one board of uh, the SMA, which is the regulator, which can uh, 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 typically, you know, give authorization to move this tobacco leaf across the across, across these boundaries. Yes, so let, let me ask you, for one sure. thing, I feel ashamed, you know, as a Chinese, I have to ask you so many details about, you know, this institutional arrangement. But, you know, let me ask you for one more thing. Who actually sure. owns or, you know, manage uh, the purchasing stations? Yeah, the stations are vertically integrated with uh, with the manufacturers. Yeah, so they're they're not independent from the manufacturers. Yeah, I see. So the local actually the local guy owns uh, the stations. That's I right. See. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yes. So. Uh, okay. So. I'll, I'll be I'll be brief on the details on, on the farmers, right? Okay, and then let me get to the model. So, <clears throat> you know, you have, you have these manufacturers. They set these leaf prices, and they play a Nash uh, uh game, I assume, on these leaf markets. So that means that every time period, they set prices, you know, in a game with each other, in order to maximize their profits of that time period. Now, there are a lot of things to be said here. So. Probably they're not profit maximizing. That's fine. So I can allow for non-profit maximizing firms, and you know, in the model, in, in, in the paper, you can, you can look it up. And so that's actually not a problem. So it just level shifts the markets and margins we're imputing. But if we look at the changes of these markets and margins over time, assuming that the utility functions of these firms are stable over time, we can still trace out the differences, that, you know, comparing these different types. Another thing, so in terms of product quality, so cigarettes are a differentiated product, so there are differences in, in product quality. Again, there, that's fine, so we can allow for uh, differences in quality, but it's kind of crucial that quality is exogenous here. So these firms choose their input prices 
but they don't choose quality. And and so, so and you know, again, there I have some extensions in which I observe some metrics about quality, and it seems fine. So so that they're not changing their quality in reaction to these changing markets. But in general, that's something uh, we should worry about. And then the final thing is that these firms, so so leaf prices are kind of highly regulated in this industry. And so, so you know, there's maybe some concern like, are these firms really choosing prices? But then there again, I include lots of you know, anecdotal evidence in the paper, which is that we know from, you know, from, from asking the farmers that there is lots of you know, room for bargaining of these manufacturers in terms of setting their prices. And so, so that's kind of, you know, the main reason to model these firms as, as, as choosers of, uh, of these prices, right? Okay, so and then the you know combining both the production function with a mo the model which I presented on how these firms choose input prices, you can get to the market expression here. Now let me explain you uh, the market expression. So this looks a little bit different compared to the existing you know the typical market uh, 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 formula which you may know, which is just you know the output elasticity of firms divided by the revenue share of, of the input uh, over which we're computing the market. So this looks different for two reasons. So first, you kind of see this additive structure here, right? So you have markets mu, revenue shares alpha of labor and materials, and output elasticity of labor beta L, and then this input supply elasticity psi M. Now you see this additive structure here because labor and materials are not, uh, are not substitutable, right? So you cannot substitute away in the intermediate inputs. And that makes that you cannot compute a markup over every input because if you choose one of the inputs, you automatically also choose all the other inputs, right? And so that makes that the marginal cost curve is always a function of all the inputs, right? Now that's crucial because now you cannot compute markups over different, over different inputs and infer information from there because there is no information in it. It's just the, the, the relative, you know, the input requirements between these inputs is fixed by definition. So, so comparing these different inputs in terms of revenue shares will only give you a, a limited set of information, right? And that applies to many other industries. So, so to any industry in which intermediate inputs are not substitutable, you have, you have this problem, right? And the second thing is that you see this uh, input supply elasticity entering the market expression. Why is that? Well. If firms increase production, so increase the number of uh, cigarettes they're producing, the input prices change as well as these firms with monopsing power. And so that's part of marginal cost. So, so the fact that if you increase your production, that input prices increase as well, is part of you know, the, re the reason why marginal costs are upper slowly. And so that makes it harder to separate out these markups from these markdowns because markups are a function of markets. Right? Okay, and that nests, you know, there's the existing models in the literature of, uh, on, on, on markets are kind of all nested in this general framework, right? So that's, that's kind of the methodological contribution of, uh, of the paper. Okay, in terms of identification, so what I will do is I will have a model, so the model I presented before, which I will estimate, of how these firms set prices in the input markets, which gives us this, this input supply analysis key psi m, combined with the production function, which will give uh, uh, the elasticity of labor uh, beta L. And then, you know, these revenue shares are data. So combining the data with you know, these parameters, which I estimate from, from, you know, the input supply and the demand model gives me the market, right? Now, there are other ways of thinking about this. So in other industries, it may be more attractive to kind of like estimate markups like we always do and then you know, get either the production function coefficients or the input supply coefficients. So, so in, in different industries, there will be a different optimal strategy to tease apart uh, all these different moving parts. But in this industry, it's clearly more attractive to kind of estimate production and estimate the supply curves, and then get markups without imposing any model of how these firms compete on their, on their product markets, right? Okay. Uh, so feel free to, in to interrupt me right, if there are uh, any questions. Okay, so a little bit more on application. So, you know, there's these three moving parts that, that uh, you know, 
need to be separated for ratification. So for the production function, we just you know see labor and capital and 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 the number of cigarettes. And so you know there, there's I've added some some you know more uh, uh, discussion of identification uh, in the paper, so you can check that uh, if you're interested. Uh, so so the key. Uh, uh, identification. Uh, so, so what we'll give as identification here is, is as in as in all of the production functional literature, is really to make assumptions on when these firms uh, uh, on the timing of, of of input decisions of these firms. So, so, in that sense, I stick to the literature. I don't add anything new. Now, there are some things that you know, if markups and and markdowns are latent, that affects how you think about identification of the production function. And so, so. For instance, in, in these proxy approaches, uh, it's not always that obvious that if you have markups and markdowns fluctuating between these firms, whether you can still identify the production function under uh, under, under you know, like a worst case in Fraser or under other types of proxy estimators. Now, I have a section on this in the, in the paper, and, and if you were interested, I, I'd be very happy to discuss this. <clears throat> Secondly, then in terms of markups, so I explained the identification uh, assumption there. And then for the leaf supply function, there we need a shifter demand. So, so we observe or we impute leaf prices, and we see how much cigarettes these firms produce. But then it's not sufficient, and so that comes back to uh, Michael's question earlier. So if we see sizes of firms and leaf prices, we should see a upward sloping relationship if these firms have monopsony power, like we were saying before. But then in order to tease apart Supply and demand. We still need a shifter of input demands to really, you know, know whether, what, like, to 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 tease apart supply and demand. And so, so just to show it in a graph. So, you know, you have the leaf supply function that is upward sloping. So the margin cost curve is even more upward sloping. And then you have different levels of input demand. And so we need, in order to know the uh, input supply elasticity of these, of these firms. We need some demand shifters that are uncorrelated to, uh, uh, to, to, to input supply, right? Now, in this paper, what I argue that you have lots of information about these firms, right? You have lots of information about manufacturers. And so if we, for instance, have the productivity levels of these manufacturers, which we estimated from the model, as long as these productivity levels don't enter the supply, so the utility function of these farmers, we can use them as shifters of demands to trace the leaf supply function. Right? And so, so the idea here is that these productivity levels are by definition shifting demands, so they're, they're relevant instruments for sure. Now, which are the conditions that are under which they're valid instruments? Well, if these far, what I'm seeing here is that these tobacco farmers don't care about how productive the manufacturers that are that they're selling to, conditional on the price they get for their for their tobacco. So if I'm a, a farmer, I care about the price I get from for, for, for tobacco leaf, and I care about these characteristics of these firms I sell to. But these productivity levels are not part of the relevant characteristics of these firms that enter my supply chain, right? And so why does this make sense? Well, this is a market in which these firms interact with the farmers on, on these leaf markets, but they don't have a long lasting relationship. So if I'm a farmer, I don't sell to the same manufacturer per se in every time period, right? And so in that sense, how productive they are doesn't really apply to me because I don't work for these firms. Now, if you think about many other types of input markets, for instance, if you think about labor markets, then this would definitely be an assumption I would not be willing to make. So, so in labor markets, for instance, you definitely do care about how productive the firm is you work for because productivity is highly correlated and you work for the firm in different time periods. And so you probably care that the firm is still around in an experience or whether the firm will you know, be increasing in terms of productivity because it will affect your future wages as well. But here in these type of static spot markets, uh, uh, I argue that this is, you know, a mechanism which you can abstract from, right? So, Michael, uh, yeah. so I think it, this is, uh, if, to me, it's reasonable, but I'm thinking about an extreme case uh, in which it might actually uh, fail to work. And this, see if it makes sense to you. Say, somehow during this period of time, 
a dramatic technological change happen. So mm -hmm. those farmers actually uh, started to produce leaves uh, at you know flat uh, uh, marginal cost. So in that case, uh, it can you know uh, not just uh, uh, make this edification kind of uh, 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 weak or doesn't work, and also can explain this. Uh, uh, I don't know what you get in the end, but I'm guessing you're gonna have uh, big you know markdowns for those um, uh, uh, those uh, those uh, those consolidated uh, uh, groups. So once you have this uh, dramatic change in the in the in the marginal cost uh, uh, curvature, right? So it can it can explain it can explain this kind of uh, uh, changes. So what, what do you think about that? Yeah, okay. I think it's, um, it's not really, <laughs> but you know, it's just a extreme case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. So, so that's that's interesting, right? So the thing is, in this industry. So, so the boring answer is in this industry, I can rule it out because I have aggregate data on productivity of these farmers and I don't see it changing at all, actually. So, so farming productivity in this industry increased by about you know, a percent or two per year, but there are no dramatic changes in terms of productivity in this industry. Now, in general, I agree, right? So, so there, are two, there would be two problems here. So first is that if we think that that productivity of these farmers is correlated with the productivity of the manufacturers, then we have a problem. So there is a big literature on you know, these vertical linkages and productivity spillovers between you know, across the vertical dimension of these industries, and that would directly uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 you know, make, make these, these exclusion restrictions uh, invalid. So, so the reason is that the productivity levels of these manufacturers would also be correlated with the productivity levels of these farmers, which would, of course, uh, uh, enter their input supply uh, function by, by definition, right? So I definitely agree that that would be, you know, that's an important check to see in this industry, like, you know, did, are there big changes in the productivity of the suppliers? Because that would, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that, that would invalidate uh, the approach. I agree. And this, now, the thing is, like, it wouldn't invalidate the entire identification approach. It would just require us to search different demand shifters to trace apart you know yeah. supply and demand. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Then the second thing is that uh, <clears throat> these changing input expenditure ratios could indeed also be related to change in productivity of these farmers. And so that's that's you know if, that's even more of a problem. So so because then the model becomes you know then you get the question is what are, can you really separate out the prices that these firms are paying and and uh, you know the productivity levels of these farmers now uh, the thing there is that well you would just need to have more data so if you would also have the data on the farmer side for instance then you could do something more uh, and then again here this is not really necessary but more in general I think that the way forward is to have linked supplier buyer data in which you have information about both you know, like the the farm specific uh, prices that 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 these that these manufacturers are paying. So here I just have an average price, and so I can never tease apart these different mechanisms. While if you have uh, farmer uh, uh, purchaser prices, then you know that would give you at least more. So for instance, by looking at heterogeneity, you would have you know, more insight into uh, into these differences. Yeah. Okay. I'll be very brief on, on estimation. So we know how to estimate a production function and we know how to estimate, you know, like a, a very 94 type of uh, uh, demand model, which I apply to the supply side. So I do both. And then I use information from the production function as these instruments for, you know, the leaf supply function. So, so I kind of nest these different uh, uh, estimation procedures. But so I'll be uh, very brief on that now. So let me go to the results for uh, the last minutes I have. So, <clears throat> so again, you know, I go to this difference and difference model. So I compute these markups and these markdowns. I estimate this the model. And then I look how both markups and markdowns change differently between these markets that consolidated and the markets that are now. And so you see it here. So the, what I find is that markdowns increased uh, uh, by about a third in these markets that consolidated compared to these other markets after 2003. 
So, so this change in, in, in market structure clearly you know, increased margins and, and so increase a wedge between these marginal products of these farmers and, uh, and what they get for, for your leaf. While I find that there is a more moderate negative effect on markups uh, in the industry. So, so on the product market side, I don't really see markups going up at all. And there is you know, some evidence that markups actually fall. Right? And in terms of productivity, I don't see, uh, I don't see big changes. Well, you know, this may be slightly underpowered, but uh, uh, at least you know, the massive productivity uh, changes that were, uh, uh, that were promised with these types of reforms didn't really seem to, uh, uh, to materialize. Now, why do you see falling markets and, and rising margins? So, so rising margins make sense, right? The far these farmers are locked in in, the, in their markets. Before they're used to sell to, to four manufacturers and now they sell to two or, or one manufacturer. So, so it kind of makes sense that these, these manufacturers now have more power to, uh, to push down these prices. Now, in terms of markups, in order to understand why you know, markups on product markets don't go up, it, it's kind of important to see, to look at the entire vertical uh, uh, nature of this industry, right? So you have these wholesalers that have monopsony power of their own, they buy cigarettes from manufacturers, and these manufacturers buy inputs from these from the suppliers, right? Now, if markdowns go up at you know the inputs at the input market side, that kind of increases profit rates of these manufacturers. And so, if you think about a simple you know Nash Bird draw model in which these wholesalers and these manufacturers are you know setting you know having some bargaining game and then setting some some cigarette price in which are sharing the surplus even if bargaining power of the wholesaler and market power of the manufacturer didn't change over time you would always have to see a falling market uh, in this industry if margins go up and so in there in the model i have some extension in which i kind of estimate uh, uh, you know, one of these bargaining models between the manufacturers and the wholesalers. And, and, and it actually makes sense that markets would fall because these, these wholesalers have mon monopsony power of its own and they're just bargaining over total surplus in this industry, which is increasing. And so as long as leaf prices drop by more than prices drop, even if you have falling markets, you would have increasing profits of these manufacturers, right? And so, so that's always a bit, Tricky, like how can markups fall and profits increase? Well, the total profit rate is a markup times the margin, right? So, so in order to think about profitability in this industry, you can increase profitability by raising cigarette prices, or you can increase profitability by pushing down input prices. And here it seems that they're just pushing down input prices more than, than, than product prices will fall, right? Uh, okay. And then, you know, very briefly, so so this is big implications, right? So so we see a massive increase in margins, and that has both you know distributional consequences. So 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 this is consequences of uh, how total uh, income is is distributed between, you know, for instance, labor and farmers. So so here, these manufacturing workers have wages that are stable, while these farmers have wages that drop, and then just increase. Uh, income inequality between these manufacturing workers and these farmers. And so I showed that you know, the effect is big within this industry. And you know, maybe in other industries as well, right? So more research would be needed on that. And secondly, also, uh, you know, in terms of efficiency, if we think about allocative efficiency, for instance, uh, uh, this increase in market power on these input markets may also have important implications uh, in terms of efficiency because now we see a reallocation of market shares between you know not towards firms that are necessarily more productive but towards firms that just have higher margins right? and so there's this classical that way loss thing that you know even if you have market power in your input markets that should induce some uh, some allocative efficiencies and so i have a section in the paper which i look into there and i do find you know uh, uh, dropping growth, uh, like you know, output growth and, and, and aggregate productivity growth in these markets that, are, that have been consolidated. Okay, and then I'll end here uh, and, and thank you for, uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, for your uh, very good comments.